Hey everyone, my name is Carly Schlein. I'm a doctor of physical therapy at Spear Physical Therapy in Chelsea, Manhattan. Uh, I went to school at Columbia University and I am now Spear's running expert, so I'm very excited to take you guys through what a running analysis is today for our running analysis program. So Spear's running analysis program is a very unique opportunity that we offer to patients and clients in the area. Uh, it entails a one-hour session with a physical therapist, and we start each session by reviewing the patient or the client's running history. So we talk about any injuries that they might be experiencing, any pain, and their goals for running. So whether that's just getting back into running, decreasing any pain that they might have, increasing the distance that they're going, or just making sure that they're able to decrease their risk for injury in the future. We continue the session by doing an assessment of range of motion, strength, flexibility, and a few different functional movements just to get an idea of how that person's body works and functions. The next part of the session takes place on our treadmill, and that involves the patient running for a certain amount of time while our OptiGate system runs. This is a unique software system that analyzes the runner's cadence, their weight placement, their step length, and how fast they're running so that the therapist can take a look at that data and video camera footage in slow motion to see exactly what's going on on each leg. That data allows us to talk to the patient and give them very specific exercises that help them decrease their pain, improve their strength, and get back to running the way that they would like to. And the end of the session is dedicated to any questions that that person may have, whether that's about their training, running shoes, orthotics, or anything else that they may have a question about. So with me today is Carla, who is very excited to be doing a running analysis with us. So Carla, tell me a little bit about what brings you in today. Yeah, so I've been running on and off for well over 10 years. Um, I sometimes run more or less depending on how good I'm feeling, what the weather is like. Um, I like running outside. Um, so if it's during the winter months, I don't run as much. And so getting in, back into it now that it is spring, uh, it takes me a while to do that. I uh, find that I just get tired while I'm out on a run. Um, usually days following, my back might tighten up, and so then it's hard to sit, stand, bend over for a period of time. So we're gonna focus a little bit more on recent running just so that I can get an idea of what you wanna move toward. Sure. So when did you start running again after kind of taking that hiatus this winter? Um, probably two months ago now. Okay. Um, I've been, I still focus more on strength training, mm -hmm. um, and my, I do CrossFit uh, three times okay. a week, Great. so that naturally will have have a burst of running in it. Yeah. Um, I've been kind of timing my 200, 400, 800 meter sprints and seeing how I'm do doing with those. And I definitely feel like for a sprint, my times are good, but I'm still worried that if I were to go out for a five mile run, I might not be able to sustain it. Okay, so you mentioned you like to run about three to five miles would be ideal on mm -hmm. a weekend. About how fast do you think you're trying to pace yourself to run each mile? Uh, so I, ideally, I'd like to be at a six mile run. Okay. Uh, uh, well, six minute so, per mile? Uh, yeah. 10 minute mile. 10 minute, okay. Yeah, sorry, so a 10 minute mile. Perfect. Um, so running three to five miles would be ideal. Any other goals that you have that you're looking to get out of this running analysis? Uh, I think that the probably the biggest thing besides distance and time would be just to find a way to really do my running so that there isn't pain or fear of injury mm -hmm. so that I could sustain it and just be much more eager to get out and run and less worried about, oh, is my back tight? Am I gonna get hurt? If I, I feel like if I have the um, know how to do it better, then I'll be able to do it more often and really sustain it long term. Sounds good. Yeah. Came to the right place. Awesome. <laughs>
the other of you may not be able to fully capture. How do you feel? Feel good. Yeah? Yeah. That's really good. Thanks. So we're going to go over some of the results. Okay. So usually what I do is I start by just going over everything I found on the table before you even got on the treadmill because okay. it helps me predict what I'm going to see on the treadmill sure. and what inefficiencies I might see when you're run actually running. Okay. So we'll start with just general strength, flexibility, range of motion, that kind yeah. of stuff. Generally pretty strong in your legs. I take a look at a few different muscle groups. So the most important ones for running are your core and your glutes. The other muscles are also gonna kick in, but those are the two muscle groups that I find need the most help moving sure. forward. So for you, I did see a little bit of weakness in those glute muscles. Okay. So there are three of those. And two groups that we look more at are the hip extensors, so that's your glute max that helps bring your leg behind you. Yeah. And then your hip abductors, so those are the ones that help bring your leg out to the side. Okay. So those would be your glute mean and your glute min. And then a little bit of um, weakness in your hip flexors. So those are the ones that'll bring your knee up to the ceiling, mm -hmm. which is very normal. Um, a lot of times people feel that those are a little bit weaker because they're sitting all day and they're a little sure. tighter. Yeah. So it's something else that we can also work on, but they're not as important in running. Okay. Flexibility-wise, also pretty good. Um, a little bit tight in the hamstrings, which yep. doesn't come as much of a surprise to yep. most people. Usually, they're very tight in people who have desk jobs, so I'll be recommending a few different flexibility exercises and modes for stretching those, just to make sure that they're nice and flexible. Okay. Really important that they have that full length of the muscle that they need, so that you can swing your leg in the front and in the back as much as you need to in a normal running cycle. Okay. Also a little bit of tightness in the calves, the calf, yeah. so we'll definitely be talking about other ways you can be yeah. stretching those as well. Okay. Range of motion wise, you look pretty good. Uh, I take a look at a few different uh, joints in the body. Okay. Some of the hip and then a lot in the ankle and in the big toe. So for you, you actually have a good amount of range of motion in the ankle and the toe, which is really important for pushing off and then for landing on the ground. Okay. So that's, that's all good stuff. Okay. What is also really important for me to look at is not just how strong you are, but how you're using your muscles. So a lot of times we can be super strong, be working at the gym and doing a lot of strength training. But when it comes to actually doing movements like squats, running, any mm -hmm. type of activity, we don't actually use those muscles the right way. Okay. So I look at the sequencing of how you use those muscles. So when you were on your side and you lifted your leg up toward the ceiling, what should happen is that your glutes should fire first because those are the muscles responsible for doing that. Mm -hmm. And then there's another muscle in the more toward the front of the hip called your TFL, which will help with doing that motion, but a lot of times it likes to take over. Our body finds ways to cheat naturally, and okay. that's a really common way for it to do that. So for you, what I did find is that TFL muscle likes to move first, and then your glutes kind of kick in to help. So we want to reverse them. We want to make sure that your body is firing those muscles the way that it should be. Okay. And that's on both sides. Okay. That makes sense? Yep. Cool. The other uh, muscle sequencing that I look at is for the other glute muscle, so your glute max. It's the one that extends your hip back, so it brings your leg back up behind you. Mm -hmm. So that's what I tested when you were on your stomach. What should happen is when you're lifting your right leg, for example, up to the ceiling, that right glute should be firing first to initiate that motion, and then your back muscle should come in to assist. A lot of runners and a lot of people who have injuries at the moment like to cheat, and they'll use their back, back first yeah. and then their glutes. So we want to make sure we're reversing that so that you're not actually injuring your back. That may actually be why you have a little bit of that back pain and tightness after running, okay. because you're overcompensating with your back muscles instead of your glutes. The glutes are some of the most powerful muscles in the body, and if we're not using them correctly, mm -hmm. then the rest of the body has to try to compensate, and that's when we tend to fatigue and have injury. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah. Cool. Otherwise, everything looks pretty good. In terms of doing your squats, your bridges, and your single leg squats, what that helps me see is how you're functionally moving around, not just running. So single leg squats are gonna be the most indicative for me. Mm -hmm. That's on one leg, which replicates running. And for you, a little bit more difficulty on the right side than on the left side, which also corresponds to you having that right-sided low back pain. Yeah. So I look at a few different things, you know, how's your knee moving? How far down are you able to go? Are you able to keep your balance? That all tells me a lot of different things, but what I saw from you most was a little bit more glute weakness than what I would want to see. Okay. Okay. So main takeaway is, we need to work on your muscle sequencing, your glute strength, and then make sure that your hamstrings and your calves are nice and flexible. Okay. All right.
Yeah. Cool. So now we get to move into the fun stuff, which is what I found on the treadmill. Awesome. Right. So for that, we take a look at a few different things, including the OptiGate. Here it takes a look at step length, so how far of a step you're taking on each leg. It takes a look at flight time and contact time as well. So if you look at this picture here, this is a normal gait cycle. Okay. So a gait cycle goes from the moment when you first make contact with the ground on one leg yep. until that same leg Comes strikes back. the ground again. Okay. It used to be called heel strike, but now mm -hmm. they're just calling it initial contact because more research is showing some people don't hit the ground with their heels. Some people hit the ground with their midfoot and their forefoot. So there's a lot of talk in the running world on what type of strike pattern is best. Okay. Okay. So this takes a look at that step length. So how far of a step are you taking uh, on each leg? Mm -hmm. And what I look to, like to look at is symmetry. Is one leg taking a lot larger of a step than the other? That's gonna tell me if you wanna spend more time on one leg or the other. But for you, you're pretty symmetrical. I'm not terribly worried about these numbers. Okay. Here. So that's pretty good. Flight time and contact time. So flight time is the amount of time that you're off the ground. Mm -hmm. Contact time is the amount of time you're on the ground. Okay. In running, more efficient running means that you're in flight for a longer period of time than you're on the ground. Okay. okay. So what we want to see is a much bigger flight time than contact time. Okay. Right now for you, you have a little bit more contact time than flight time. So we want to reverse that, and the way that we're going to do that is by working on your cadence. So I'll go into that in a little bit, okay. but just how many steps you're taking per minute. Okay. I also take a look at the symmetry of these, so making sure that you're you know, in flight or on the ground for about the same amount of time on each leg. And for you, you're about the same, 38 versus 39%, 62 versus 60%. Okay. So it's pretty symmetrical. So that's the data that the OptiGate captures okay. besides the video camera. Okay. Any questions on that? No. Cool. So then we get to go to the cameras and see what's actually going on <laughs> when you're running. So the cameras capture um, how you're running from a few different points of view. So what I do is I take a look at each leg at different points in the gait cycle. So when you first make contact with the ground, and then at mid stance on that leg. So the midpoint of that leg being on the ground mm -hmm. before it's in flight. Okay. okay. So we'll start with your right leg. I'll blow this up. So what I do is I look at everything from head to toe. Because what might be happening up higher is affecting what's going on down lower and vice versa. So we don't want to neglect any part of the body. So for you, I start up at the shoulders, and what I'm looking at is how much are you rotating your upper back? There should be some rotation. Some rotation is normal mm -hmm. in a runner, but what we don't want to see is you crossing over your body too much. That's your body's way of compensating for weak glutes. So for you right now, you're, you're rotating a little bit more over to that right side than what we would want to see. Okay. So that goes back to that right glute weakness that we found on the table. Sure. Okay. If we drop down to your hips, we take a look at whether they're level or if one side is dropped versus the other. Right now, doing pretty okay. Looks okay. good. Another thing that I do is I find the back of your hip and I draw a line straight to the ground. And what should happen is your knee and the back of your heel should fall within that line. For you, you're a little bit inside. So what you're doing is actually what's called a little bit of scissoring. So you're narrowing your base of support. You're kind of cutting in and decreasing how much space there is between each foot on the ground. Okay. So we'll be working on that with a couple of pointers later on as well. Okay. Okay. In terms of your knees, there should be a little bit of space that you can see between your knees and you're a little bit tighter. So again, that goes back to opening up, making that base support bigger. And then we also want to make sure that your ankle is in a good amount of motion at that point when it's hitting the ground. So for you, I'm not terribly worried about that. It looks okay. like a healthy amount. So big takeaways from what this told us is we need to work on glute strength on both sides, right a little bit more than left. Okay. We'll be working on that base of support to make sure that you're opening everything up. And then we'll also be working on some core strength mm -hmm. so that you're not arching your back as much. Okay. The last thing that uh, the OptiGate looks at and that I take a look at is your cadence. So that's how many steps you're taking per minute. Mm -hmm. And I found that you're running at 156 steps per minute. There's a lot of research out there that kind of throws around these numbers for what's the most efficient form of running. And the research has found that 180 steps per minute is most efficient. Okay. 
Now jumping straight from wherever you are, so yeah. for you 156 to 180 is not good. <laughs> it tends right. to actually aggravate any injury and it's a little bit too, too much too soon. So what I do is I incrementally increase it and we'll talk about ways that you can be doing that at home. Okay. okay.